Hi everyone and welcome to our second digestion screencast. Today we're going to be talking all about all of the rest of the organs involved with digestion. We'll start with the pancreas. The pancreas is a dual organ and what that means is that half of it is an endocrine gland which means that it makes hormones and the hormones that the pancreas makes are insulin and glucagon and these are involved with controlling our blood sugar levels. The pancreas is also an exocrine gland which means that it creates makes enzymes and it makes many of the enzymes that help us to digest our food. If we look at the pancreas you can see that it's tucked underneath the small intestine and the stomach and it's got a little duct that leads from the pancreas into the top part of the small intestine. That is a common duct. There's special cells inside the pancreas called the islets of Langerhans. And when you have high blood sugar, a blood sugar level that's greater than 0.1%, what the pancreas will do is it will release insulin into the bloodstream. And the insulin will take the sugar, the extra sugar, out of the blood. And it does that in three ways. It will either store it as glycogen in the liver and the muscles. It will turn the sugar into fat. Or it will cause all of your cells to absorb more sugar into the cells. If you have low blood sugar, a blood sugar level less than 0.1% glucose, then your pancreas will make and release glucagon. Glucagon is a hormone that does the opposite of insulin. So it will cause sugar to go back into your blood. And it does that by telling the liver and the muscles to take that glycogen and chop it back up into glucose. So here's a picture of the pancreas and you, you can see clearly the duct that connects it to the small intestine. You can also see the islet of Langerhans cells. These, blue, these are the cells that make insulin and glucagon. The closer look at the islets of Langerhans is what it actually looks like. And the pancreas also has an exocrine function and that is that it makes many enzymes. So the enzymes that the pancreas makes we can use the acronym SALT plus N. So the S in salt stands for sodium bicarbonate, which helps to neutralize the stomach acid. The A in salt stands for amylase. This is the amylase made in the pancreas, so we call it pancreatic amylase. It helps to digest starch. L stands for lipase, which helps to digest fats or lipids. And the T stands for trypsin, which helps to further digest proteins. And the N stands for nucleases, which of course help to digest DNA and RNA. So let's first start talking about sodium bicarbonate. It's NaHCO3, sodium bicarbonate. It's a base, just like baking soda, and it neutralizes all of those acids that are coming in with the acid chyme from your stomach. So it takes that acid chyme from a pH of 2.5 to a pH of 8.5, and it creates an optimum atmosphere for all of the other enzymes coming from the small intestine and the pancreas and it helps them to work at their maximum speed and keeps them from being denatured. The A stands for amylase. Amylase of course digests starch just like it did in the saliva but this is pancreatic amylase so instead of digesting cooked starch like we do in the mouth in the small intestine the pancreatic amylase digests uncooked starch like a raw potato but it also chops it up into maltose just like the salivary amylase chopped the cooked starch into maltose. So here's your starch being chopped up into a disaccharide maltose. Lipase is an enzyme that takes lipids or fats and it chops them up into fatty acids and glycerol. So just one example of a fat that would be chopped up this way is a triglyceride or a neutral fat. And lipase will chop those all apart so you end up with one glycerol molecule and three fatty acid molecules. So this picture would be more accurate if you had three long carbon chains, three fatty acid chains and one glycerol be having been chopped apart from each other by the lipase. The T stands for trypsin. Trypsin I think of as T-Rex, which also starts with a T-R, and we know that a T-Rex is a dinosaur that ate lots of meat. It was a carnivore, and of course there's a lot of protein in meat, so trypsin digests protein. And it takes those small protein chains that we chopped up large protein chains into small protein chains in the stomach with our pepsin enzyme and now trypsin will do the second phase on proteins and it will digest those small polypeptides further into dipeptides which have two amino acids and tripeptides which have 
three amino acids. So we take those small proteins and chop them up even farther. But we're still not fully digested yet. Nucleases are going to chop DNA and RNA up into nucleotides. Now DNA and RNA of course are very extremely large molecules and it takes a lot of time and a lot of enzymes to chop those fully up into the nu nucleotides. So you actually get a double shot of nucleases being released. Some of that is released by your pancreas and some of it is released in your small intestines. So here the pancreatic nuclease will chop DNA and RNA up into nucleotides, A's, C's, T's, and G's. Here's a look at what that exocrine gland actually looks like. So, so these are the cells in your pancreas that make the enzymes and the sodium bicarbonate. S, A, L, T, and N. Sodium bicarbonate, amylase, lipase, trypsin, and nucleases. Make sure you memorize those. There's three parts to the small intestine. The duodenum is the first part and this is where we begin our chemical digestion. The jejunum is the second part of the small intestine. It finishes, completes the digestion of all the different types of foods, carbs, proteins, fats, and nucleic acids, and you begin absorption. And then the ileum is the longest section of the small intestine because you need a lot of time to now absorb all that food that's been chopped up into smaller nutrients. This is what a small intestine looks like. You can see in the middle the small intestine is held together by what we call the mesentery. So this connects the small intestines together. It's connective tissue. It's like that saran wrap that we were talking about in the histology unit. And when you're looking inside your rat, you'll notice if you wanted to lay out your intestines end to end and figure out how long the intestines are, you have to chop away that mesentery. When you're talking about structurally what the small intestines look like on the inside, you'll notice that, um, of course, they have to be really good at their job, which is digesting and then absorbing all of the nutrients. And so the best way to do that is by increasing the surface area by a significant amount. So if you think about a hand that's closed up into a fist, and the food's moving across that fist, there's very few places where that food can actually be absorbed. But if you think about your hand with your fingers fully extended, then there's a lot more space when the food is going past for all of those nutrients to be absorbed. And that's exactly what the small intestine is like. The small intestine is highly, highly folded, and those folds are called villi, just like this picture here. The villi are not hairs, they're not cilia, they're just folds of the inner surface of the small intestine. And these folds highly increase the surface area and make your body able to absorb the maximum amount of nutrition from the food that you eat. Those villi also have smaller folds called microvilli. So if you take a close look at a villi from the small intestine, this is what it would look like. On the inside, you've got this kind of yellow tube. That yellow tube is called a lacteal. Now that is part of the lymphatic system. You're going to have to be able, by the way, to draw a villi, so make sure you can draw a villi, a folded part of the small intestine with a lacteal and the blood vessels surrounding the lacteal. So you see here the capillaries. These are mesenteric capillaries, capillaries in the digestive system, and they surround the lacteal. This is where other types of food get absorbed. So if you chopped a uh, a small intestine in half, you could see the villi, the folds all the way around the small intestine. So absorption takes place through the columnar cells of the microvilli, that's these cells here. And this takes a lot of energy because it's active transport, so you need a lot of mitochondria in these intestinal cells. If you took your small intestines and you spread them all out flat, you would have, on, for an average person, 180 meters squared. So that's about the size of a tennis court. So lots of surface area in your intestines to digest and then absorb your food. So what is the actual function of the small intestine? Well, we complete the digestion of all the different types of foods. Proteins, like you get from these eggs. Fats, lipids, like you get from this milk and, and these. Carbs, like you get from these breads. And of course, DNA and RNA, nucleic acids that you get from every type of food. That you then we also absorb all of the nutrients. We absorb our amino acids into the bloodstream. We absorb our sugars and other monomers, monosaccharides, into the bloodstream. We absorb nucleotides into the bloodstream. We absorb fatty acids and glycerol 
into the lymphatic system, into that inner tube, into that lacteal. So we're not quite finished yet because I haven't explained yet how do we get all of the proteins, carbs, fats, and nucleotides chopped down into those very smallest of their monomers. Well, the small intestine helps us to do that as well. There are glands in the duodenum, in the first part of the small intestine, that make intestinal juices. And what's inside these intestinal juices? Enzymes. They help to fully digest all of our types of food. The duodenum makes its own enzymes. Those enzymes are called the intestinal juices. So, what's in the intestinal juices? Well, let's learn the names of these enzymes. I use the acronym, please, no more lame snacks. And each of those letters stands for a different enzyme. Peptidases, which break peptides down to their smallest form, amino acids. Nucleases, which will further digest DNA and RNA into nucleotides, A's, C's, T's, and G's. Maltase, which will digest maltose into glucose and glucose. Lactase, which will digest lactose into glucose and galactose. Sucrase, which will digest sucrose into glucose and fructose. All of those monomers are what get absorbed into your villi. So please, no more lame snacks. So peptidases digest those peptides into amino acids. Remember that those peptides were cho chopped from smaller proteins by trypsin into peptides, and now peptidases will digest them into amino acids. Nucleases will take all of the DNA and RNA that hasn't been fully chopped up yet and it will continue chopping it up into nucleotides, A's, C's, T's, and G's. Maltase will digest maltose into two sugars. So there's your disaccharide maltose, which was digested from starch by amylase, and now maltase will chop it further up into glucose and glucose. Just like you can see in this picture, the enzyme is maltase, the substrate is maltose, and maltose will fit into maltase, and maltase will catabolize it, chop it up into two glucose molecules. Remember, that's also called hydrolysis. Lactase will digest lactose into glucose and galactose. Sucrase will digest sucrose, a disaccharide, into glucose and fructose, and then the villi will absorb all of those monomers into either the bloodstream or the lacteal. So the sugars, the amino acids, and the nucleotides will be absorbed into the bloodstream that surrounds the lacteal, and the glycerol and fatty acids will be absorbed into the lacteal, into the lymphatic system. When the small intestine is finished its jobs, then it will be connected to the large intestine and it's connected through a special sphincter called the ileocecal sphincter. It connects the ileum, the last part of the small intestine, to the cecum of the large intestine, so we call it the ileocecal sphincter. And you'll see that's very close to the appendix. So the water, the juices, all of that indigestible food and fiber will move from the small intestine and go into the large intestine so the large intestine, the reason we call it large is because it's large in diameter, not because it's long. It's actually quite, quite a bit shorter than the small intestine. It has five parts, the ascending colon, the transverse colon, descending colon, and the sigmoid or S-shaped colon. And of course the last part, the rectum. And the rectum is connected to the anus. The ascending, the transverse, the descending, the sigmoid, and the rectum. So what is the job of the large intestine? Well, it absorbs all of the water that it can and all of the salts that it can. We also have a lot of E. coli living in this large intestine. And what the E. coli does is one of its main jobs is it slows how quickly the waste moves through the colon and that gives lots of time for us to reabsorb the water and the salts. The bacteria also eat the wastes. They eat the fiber, they eat the cellulose and their wastes help us to survive. So their wastes, inside their wastes, are things like vitamin K and amino acids. We need vitamin K to clot our blood. These bacteria also make hormones or growth factors and they help to stimulate cell growth in our bodies. And of course they make waste of their own and that waste is methane gas and that is what we excrete from our bodies. Here's a picture of a colon or a large intestine and this is where we absorb some water and salt from our indigestible waste. Make sure you come to class with all your hot questions about these parts of the digestive system.